In September 2019, I was invited to visit the headquarters of the Bloodhound LSR project in the southwest of England. Whilst the team prepared the car for high speed trials, driver Andy Green answered my questions about the car and his role in the project. Bloodhound from the very first day that the, the car was conceived was created to do something unique. This is the first land speed record car of the digital age. So it gives us the chance not just to run at higher speeds than anybody has ever contemplated before, ultimately with the capability to go up to 1000 miles an hour, 1600 kilometers an hour, but also to be able to share that with a global audience live. So we can stream live video, we can stream live data from the car to a global audience. We can provide apps to allow people to look at different views of the car, to look at different amounts of data, to visualize how the pressure differential across the car works in terms of the pressure distribution at very high speeds. And the differences between that and the very high fidelity models that uh, Swansea University have just produced for us. We can engage the largest engineering audience in the history of motorsport right there with this car. YouTube has offered this fantastic opportunity and we're going to seize it with both hands. It allows us to showcase great British engineering on a global stage because we've got the world's best motorsport engineers in this country and some of the world's best aerospace engineers. This car is a fantastic combination of those two technologies. So it's showcasing the engineering, it is telling a global story to a new generation and to inspire that young generation about the excitement of the science and the technology and the engineering and the mathematics of a, an extraordinary car like this. To attempt to get to 1,000 miles an hour, 1,600 kilometers an hour, we are going to need more than just the world's best jet engine. We're incredibly lucky to have the Rolls-Royce EJ200, um, one of the late model prototypes which has now completed all of its uh, airborne testing for the Eurofighter program. We have one of those with a few hours left on it to power this car. But that will not be enough by itself because no jet fighter in history has, has managed 1,000 miles an hour at ground level. It is a measure of just how difficult this task is that we are trying to exceed not just the world land speed record, we are trying to exceed the world low altitude airspeed record. For the first time since 1913, we are building a car that has the potential to go faster than any aeroplane at ground level. That is the size of this challenge. So to do that, we have a, uh, the jet engine from Rolls-Royce and we're combining that with the NAMO hybrid rocket technology. Now the hybrid rocket is something we need to go supersonic and beyond uh, land speed records and ultimately to work up to a thousand miles an hour, that hybrid rocket technology is still in development. It is literally that cutting edge, it is being developed right now. In the meantime, the high speed testing, we're aiming up to about 500 plus miles an hour this year. For that, the EJ200, the Rolls-Royce jet engine, is more than adequate, so we're running jet only this year, and the intake you see behind me is where it will gather all of the air to produce the huge amount, around about nine tons of thrust, 90 kilonewtons of thrust, um, to take the car up from stationary to 500 plus miles an hour in around about a minute before we slow it back down again with the air brakes, parachutes and wheel brakes. Anytime you're accelerating, more acceleration is always optional. You can always throttle back and slow down again. As soon as you come bursting out of the timing lights at supersonic speeds, slowing down before the end of the track has just become compulsory. So we have built in a huge amount of redundancy into the stopping aids to make absolutely certain that whatever happens, this car can be stopped safely within the track length available. So we envisage the, uh, uh, the primary stopping aid being air brakes, simply because they're very simple, hydraulically mounted device. They come out like big elephant's ears either side of the car in front of the rear wheels. That raises some questions about how much buffet turbulence, vibration it produces at the back end, how much it affects the rear end stability of the car and how quickly we can put them out. But fundamentally, that's how aeroplanes slow down to so increase the drag of the vehicle to slow it down. As a backup to the air brakes, we then have a drag parachute. And as a backup to the air brakes and the drag parachute, in case there's a problem with both of those, we have a separate drag parachute. So there are three different ways of stopping the car, any one of which is enough to stop in the distance available. Collectively, they guarantee that we are going to be able to slow the car down to below 200 miles an hour, where we can then take over with the conventional disc brakes on the front wheels. Bloodhound is unusual in that, unlike a normal land speed record, where you would mark out, say, 10 or 12 miles or 
let's take Thrust SSC's case, 13 miles of, uh, of the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, have a team station at each end, fire the car from one end to the other and need to stop right next to that team. But if you did have a problem, there's plenty of overrun. The Haxking Pan in South Africa, it's got a better weather factor, it's got a better surface, it's got everything we need apart from an overrun. So we need to make sure that whatever happens, we stop within that available length. Therefore, to give us the option to have a parachute failure in a second deployment or something like that, we will always be stopping a mile or two before the end of the track. As soon as the car rolls to a stop, we'll then disconnect the parachute so we don't drag it down the desert. We will then drive the car down to the end of the track, which also allows us to let the jet engine cool down because the jet needs a five minute cooling period. During that period, I will actually be driving it back down to the end of the track, throwing the steering hard over, a big 180, park next to the, uh, the recovery and uh, receive crew so that they can start getting the car ready for its return run because to set a world land speed record you need to do this twice within one hour. High speed testing is all about proving this vehicle on the desert. We need to look at the wheel interaction with the desert, we look, need to look at how the desert handles, how much grip it will give us both laterally and in terms of uh, rolling drag for braking. We need to look at the aerodynamics of the car, how well they match the extraordinary modelling capability that uh, Swansea University has developed to predict both subsonic and supersonic aerodynamics in incredible detail. But this is still, this is cutting edge world class modelling. So exactly how accurate is it is, we will find out during that uh, high speed testing. We need to test the brake parachutes very conventional system but it's a different uh, installation in this car and of course it's a different vehicle so the airflow behind it will be different the deployment will be different parachutes are a critical part of slowing down as are the air brakes which we'll also be testing the list goes on in terms of validating the whole car end to end ready for a land speed record attempt next year and training the team on how to operate a high speed vehicle safely out in the desert in south africa that's what high speed testing 2019 is all about The only time the design of this stops evolving is after its last run when it goes to a museum. Right. Up until that point, we are still learning and developing the science because we are going, by definition in a land speed record, to a place where human beings have never been before. The outright world land speed record is faster than anyone has ever been. You are going to learn things that no one else has had a chance to learn because you're doing something no one has done before. And when you've got a car with 500 sensors on board, you're going to learn an awful lot. There are pros and cons to taking a long time to, uh, uh, to build a, a very high performance vehicle like this as the technology moves on. If we were going to start again, Bloodhound would look dramatically different. We would probably use different power plants, we would probably use a different shape, we might even go to a different desert because all of the assumptions, the mass, the performance, the distance, all of those would be different. But we aren't starting again, we're starting from here where we are right now. But there are some real clear benefits. For instance, 10 years ago we really, really wanted to produce an electric solution to powering the rocket pump. Now, the rocket pump solution that, uh, that we've had up till now has been a, a Jaguar V8 supercharged engine. So producing, you know, five, 600 horsepower to, uh, to drive a rocket pump motor is a spectacularly large amount of power just to turn a little pump about this big. That's the amount of power that a rocket requires to drive it. 10 years ago, there was no possibility we could do that with uh, some kind of electrical power, uh, power plant. The Tesla Roadster was just coming, uh, becoming available, but you'd need to put about three of those end to end to get that. Nowadays, that's available off the shelf, so we can electrify it. It makes it much easier in terms of not having a great big hot uh, piston engine with all the uh, petrol and the exhausts and the intakes and working out where to put them in aerodynamic turns. Um, we don't have to worry about clutches and uh, gearboxes and all the other problems. We can actually just do it all with a single button press with an electric motor and have enough charge in the batteries probably to do it twice so we don't even have to recharge it halfway through. That's the sort of benefit that modern technology brings. The tricky bit about getting to, uh, to 1,000 miles an hour, which ultimately was our you know, blank sheet of paper, is this possible, is to work out exactly where to put the power on so that you peak in the middle of the, uh, to middle to the end of the measured mile. So that was, that's about a one to two second time bracket where you have to get the, the peak speed. There are a couple of ways of doing that. It is largely distance dependent because of the, uh, the, the, the way the dynamics work, but there is some flex in that depending on headwinds, um, at the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere on the day. 
So there, there is a way of actually producing a display which compensates for all of that and actually moves the rocket firing marker backwards or forwards a little bit. Now, I spent about two years working out exactly how we could incorporate a display onto the Speedo, which would give me all the firing cues for rocket on, off, parachute and air brake cues to also allow me to monitor their performance in real time in a single integrated display and then took that to the systems team and said, actually, yes, we can produce the software behind that. And I also worked out technically how it should be possible. They have now worked out how to program that in. So we have all the capability to be able to fire that very precisely based on the computer models of how the car will perform. So the first thing we have to do is update those computer models to measure exactly what the aerodynamic rolling resistance and other drag, things that there aren't models for. Rolling resistance, approximately 0.08 of a G, we think might be 0.075, might be 0.09. That makes a difference when you're talking about a one second time bracket traveling at a thousand miles an hour. So we've got to work out all of that. I then have to accelerate the car through all of the various stages of winding the jet engine up to max dry power, max reheat, trigger the rocket at exactly the right time based on the predicted distance modified by the environmental conditions on the day, hold all of that, keep the car straight all the way up through to the end of the measured mile, shut the car down exactly at that stage, it will have peaked at about 2G in acceleration, so 40 miles an hour per second of acceleration. Throttling back to idle at the end of the measured mile, the car will start slowing down immediately, just with aerodynamic drag, at 3G. 3G in car terms is 60 miles an hour per second. That is like driving a road car at 60 miles an hour and coming to a complete stop in one second. It is quite a violent experience. The violence of that experience on the, the physiological effect on the body is doubled if you've just been accelerating hard, which I have. So the sign change from positive to negative acceleration as we start slowing down is, is quite significant. As soon as the uh, drag starts coming off and we start to get down to around supersonic speeds, a little over for the air brakes, a little under for the parachute, depending on what we're doing, put the air brake or parachute out, the G comes back up to 3G, and yet, you know, yet again we're throwing 60 miles an hour per second off the car. As it uh, coasts down towards 200 miles an hour, wheel brakes to finish up stopped 12 miles away from the, where the car started, two minutes after setting off. We don't know how noisy the cockpit's going to be. Um, it was quieter than I was expecting at Newquay, but that's before we start to get up to transonic and supersonic airflow and start generating some very powerful shockwaves over the cockpit. That is something, something that we are doing some aeroacoustic modelling with, uh, with a couple of world leaders who are also doing that for the European Space Agency on satellite launches. So we have the best data in the world. Even then, there's a big error boundary on that. It's one of the things we're going to learn. In terms of the visibility outside the cockpit, I need to follow the line in front of me. Um, in terms of looking out the side, you only need to look out of the sides if somebody's going to overtake you. I believe in the objectives of this programme, which are not just to set another world land speed record, but actually to showcase great British engineering on a global stage, to take the opportunity as the first high speed supersonic car of the digital age, to share this adventure with the largest online engineering audience in the history of the world. Tens of millions of people will be able to watch live, not just the video, but the data, look at the apps, see what's actually going on for the world's fastest car and to see the science and engineering as we are discovering and refining the modeling capabilities and the performance of this vehicle. Now, for me as a mathematician, for me as a fighter pilot, to have the chance to work with an amazing team of engineers in this building, to have the chance to show off great British engineering, to have the chance to promote science and technology to another generation, why wouldn't I want to do that? My thanks to Andy Green and the rest of the Bloodhound LSR team for their help in putting this video together. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for updates and check out my other videos about the history and the future of speed record breaking. Until next time.